Hello, Red Lion Logbook here, and I promised a while ago that when the Demogorgon Labyrinth arc ended in the 100 Years Quest manga, I would rank all of the Fairy Tale members from weakest to strongest. So let's get started. So at 36, the weakest member is going to surprise a lot of you, but it's Magaroff. So Magaroff, even though he was once a, a wizard saint, he is now just a crippled old man who really can't do anything. And before any of you mentioned he fought with Natsu, he did not. He was possessed by a ghost whose power was determined by a few factors that allowed him to fight in Makarov's body. Other than that, Makarov couldn't do anything. Once again, he's just a crippled man in a wheelchair at this point. At 35, we got Happy, because Happy literally can do nothing but fly. He can carry people too, well, one person, but that's about it. So, there you go. At 34, we have Nab. The thing about Nab is that he literally doesn't work. He just sits there and never takes a job. Just a really lazy guy. And fun fact, he his magic is something that I actually had to look up because most people don't know what it is. Just like Bisco, he's able to take souls, but he's able to take souls of animals and put them into himself, and then he's able to use the power of those animals. So a bear's strength, a leopard's uh, mobility, an ostrich's speed. Like, he can do that. Like, he, he can use the power of animals. So it's actually a pretty useful ability. He's just fat and lazy. At 33, we got V'ger. There are two things we know about V'ger. One, he uses dance magic, and two, he uses a punching bag whenever the whole guild decides to fight. That's that's really all there is to him. <laughs> At 32, we have Redis. His art magic is actually quite useful because while it's not the best in combat, it's quite good at support and basically tricking your opponent. The only problem is that if the opponent is smart enough, they can well see through his art and basically he screwed after that. Unfortunately, that just makes him a one-trick pony, so that's that's how it goes. At 31, we have Kanana. She is basically mostly a waitress. She doesn't really have a lot of, you know, combat experience. But because she was once a snake, she has basically poisoned smoke. And that's really what makes her such a dangerous character is the fact that while her ability isn't the strongest, it's very broken. The fact that she can just paralyze and poison people basically at jump. So you basically got to take her down before she gets a chance to, you know, use her, uh, her magic. But still, primarily just a waitress. Number 30, we got Warren. Warren basically has psychic abilities that he can read your mind or communicate with you. So he's actually quite good if his opponent is weaker or roughly around his power because he can just basically dodge all their moves or out, or brutally outsmart anyone with broken abilities because he knows what they're thinking. The problem is that when it comes to just overwhelming power, he gets crushed. Like, <laughs> he doesn't have the speed to keep up with his mind reading. 29, we got Romeo. Romeo's a kid, and that's really all he is, except for the simple fact that he does actually have pretty good fire magic, and he's been well-trained. The thing is that, once again, he's a kid, and he's not a dragon slayer, so he doesn't really have access to dragon force or anything. He's just, just a normal kid, still still growing, still getting stronger. At 28, we got Wakaba. Wakaba is, has smoke magic, which is actually quite versatile and useful, which is why he's one of the stronger, weaker members of the, uh, of the guild. But the problem is he's also just an old man, and so he's already at his, at his peak and he can't really get any stronger or do much more. At 27, we got Mac. Uh, him and Wagaba are actually pretty interchangeable since they're basically partners and they've always been portrayed as being equal. Just old men who do their thing. <laughs> Mac is basically a fire user, so got fire and smoke. It's basically their dynamic. I'm just putting him above because he's always been portrayed as as basically the the upper of the two of them, even though they're basically equal. At 26, we got Lackey. Uh, she's a wood user, and the fact of the matter is that she's able to do a massive AOE attack that is basically able to devastate everyone around her. So anyone below her on this list is basically going to get destroyed by the AOE, and anyone above her is basically able to either break through it or dodge it. At 25, we have Droy. Droy uses plants, but he's also fat and just has a lot of issues. But at the but his AOE is actually even greater than that of uh, Lucky. So he's actually a superior version of her. At 24, we got Sharla. She, in her human form, is very nimble, agile, strong even. She basically has the flexibility and strength to take down pretty much anyone below this list. She's actually a pretty good partner for Wendy. At 23, we got Jet. He's fast, like real fast. Pretty much anyone below this list is getting just crushed by him. He, they have no chance of keeping up with him, and so he can basically beat them down before they can even do anything. But everyone above him is basically gonna just kick his ass as well, so <laughs> he's stuck in the in the 20s still. At 22, we got Levy. Levy is smart, like real smart. She pretty much can just outwit everyone in the guild, <laughs> not just everyone below her, but obviously she's gonna be overwhelmed by their power with everyone above, above her, but everyone below her, outwit, just beat easily. <laughs> Like, it really isn't much of a competition for her. She's just that much smarter than pretty much everyone else in the guild. 
And this is all about who wins in a fight, not about who wins at a tournament. So even though Levy doesn't have the power, she doesn't have the smarts to get this far. At 21, I got Alzik. Alzik is a great sniper. He's probably one of the more efficient fighters when it comes to the lower ranks of the guild. Yeah, he, he's respectable in, his, in the fact that he can just kick pretty much all the ass he needs to. At 20, we got Biska. Biska and Alice are roughly the same, but even Alice has basically admitted that she's a better uh, sniper than he is. Now, I will say, if she had the Jupiter Cannon, unfortunately, I think it's stationary, but if she could use the Jupiter Cannon and she had the range, she'd crush so many people on this list, even even people of the higher ups, because she's just devastating with that. But uh, I'm not going to let her have that at the moment, because that's a very niche, niche moment in time that she can use that. And rounding out the lower tiers at number 19 is Max. Max has been portrayed as basically being the strongest of the lower tiers of the Fairytale Guild, so it makes perfect sense that he would be here <laughs> at the top of the bottom. Okay, that means this half are actually the more combat half that are usually on the front lines and doing most of the fighting. That would be number 18 is Lazana. Yeah, so with her animal takeover, Lazana is basically a frontline fighter, but she doesn't get a lot of uh, one-on-one -on -one fights, really. She usually has to deal with the uh, uh, the fodder, but she's usually just wiping them out left and right because, let's be honest, she has the power of an animal combined with a human. This means she has one of the most diverse abilities out there because she can literally just pick an animal and become a hybrid. If she got more one-on-one -on -one fights, she'd actually be pretty good at it. At 17, we got Mess, who basically has two abilities. One where he can manipulate people's memories and such, and even implant memories into their minds which caused them to react in a way that they would never would, like he did to with Brandish stabbing August. And he also has teleportation, which is just broken. <laughs> His teleportation is probably the best movement ability in all of Fairy Tale. Because he doesn't just, it isn't just minor teleportation. Like, he was able to outrun a fucking nuke base when he saved Wendy and Carla from uh, blowing up the face. He would definitely be higher on the list if he was more focused on strength, but he isn't. He's more focused on, like, being a spy, being cunning, uh, winning his opponent, getting them when their guard is down, that kind of thing. But, yeah, he, he he's really, really overpowered with his uh, mind manipulation and teleportation. At 16, we have Panther Lily. Panther Lily really doesn't have any other ability other than the fact that he's a giant muscular cat that can fly, which is more than enough. Oh yeah, he's also a master swordsman. So he really is just able to just beat down any of these other opponents that are lower on the list just with brute force. That's just who Panther Lily is. There's a reason why he's Gajiel's partner and why they actually tag team a lot in fights because Gajiel knows he can trust him to basically have his back. At 15, we have Evergreen. Which should be pretty obvious the main reason why is because of her broken ability. That if you look into her eyes, she can just turn you to stone. It doesn't matter how powerful you are, it's an instant win for her. And even if you find a way around her eyes, her fairy magic is actually pretty versatile with the ability to allow her to fly with full range of motion, able to create explosions from tiny little particles that you don't even see, produce lasers, actually be solidified into like swords and spears and such, training under Loxus for the purposes of being better than Urza. Now, she has never gotten anywhere near Urza in power, but it's a perfect uh, goal to have to become stronger. At 14, we have Biska. Basically, he's able to produce uh, an army of the undead where he's just able to keep just and then no matter how much you destroy his what he calls babies they just possess other inanimate objects and just keep fighting he basically has an immortal army at that point and if he feels like it he could even rip your soul out of your body with his eyes his biggest weakness is the simple fact that he's a long-range fighter and so if you are able to get past his babies pretty much gonna be able to just kick his ass but yeah that's easier said than done at 13 we got freed and basically everyone's recognized him as Lux's right hand even when Lux's was kicked out of the guild Freed was basically seen as the new leader of the Thunder Legion. And it's pretty obvious why. If given prep time, he's borderline invincible because he's able to use his magic to set up scenarios where he basically has a set of rules that he basically decides how a battle goes. You do not have any chance against him on that unless you have the ability to rewrite his magic, which very few people know how to do. And if he doesn't have prep time, he's still able to like speed cast with his writing ability, his writing magic, and basically curse you with all kinds of things. Like legit, he just write pain. If you get hit by that, you just feel pain. And he just keeps doing this onto you as much as he feels like it. At 12, we got Kana. Now, I know long ago, Free easily beat Kana. Nowadays, that doesn't mean anything. Kana now has way more mastery over a card magic where she can literally just trap an entire guild of people. Did when she saved everyone's lives in an instant in her cards. Or when she did with during the whiteout 
uh, arc. Combine that with Fairy Glitter, which, yes, takes a long cast to do. The fact that it's a one-shot kill is <laughs> irrelevant to how long the cast takes. Plus, the length of the cast doesn't really matter when she's completely blitzed, because she was able to dodge attacks from Juvia and Grey <laughs> in the Whiteout arc while casting the spell. So, in 11th place, I have Elfman. Elfman, just like Kana, is kind of relied upon as the backup, just in case the <laughs> top 10s can't do the job. Or, they can do the job, but they just need that little extra oomph. To be honest, I actually debated for a long time if Kana should go first or, or Elfman, but I finally decided that Elfman should be ahead of Kana, based on the simple fact that the guy may not have any broken abilities like Kana. He is a tank. Like, the guy take beating like no other and just keep going. He just push for that little extra that's needed for him to win a fight. At number 10, we got Juvia, which should be pretty understandable. The girl is basically untouchable by most people because of her ability of being made of water, but also for the simple fact that, that while Keys was powerful, Juvia was holding Mac the entire time because Keys was basically using Gray's dad as a hostage. Otherwise, she brushed him pretty easily. And I know it's weird to bring up Keys, but that's really the last major fight uh, Juvia had, which is why I can only keep her at like 10 on the list. And also why we have at 9, Lucy. Yeah, so Lucy is always betrayed as being the weakest member of Team Natsu, but that's still saying something because she's still part of Team Natsu. Her abilities are pretty broken away. She's able to summon basically special spirits to fight alongside her, her star dresses, and now that she has the ability to fuse star dresses into combinations, at the time she was able to fuse Gemini and Aquarius, her two strongest celestial spirits, into one, into a super star dress that basically allowed her to obliterate Kira in a single attack. It's insane the fact that she can just use Aquarius' water and create doubles of her allies, so this way they can, she can use them as both a weapon, defense, and at the same time the celestial body attack that she has that can basically obliterate an enemy like Fairy Glitter. She's basically just a better version of Kana at this point, with even more tricks up her sleeve, <laughs> like summoning more allies like Sistral Spirits. It's insane how strong Lucy has become. So at 8, we have Mira Jane. The reason why I have Mira Jane ahead of Lucy, even though Lucy has all this new insane power because while Lucy was able to defeat one dragon slayer with everything she had, Mara Jane crushed two members of, <laughs> of Diablos by herself. It was barely even a fight at that point. Once she once she got a grasp on how to how to do damage to both of them, both the Ash dude and the Iron Dragon dude, she just wailed on them. It would like they were just annihilated in a matter of seconds. It, it wasn't even a fair fight. Honestly, if Mary Jane had the drive that she had when she was younger, she probably would be able to keep up with Urza, but Obviously, that's just not who she is anymore. At 7, we have Wendy. Because of this past arc, the Domergon Labyrinth arc, Wendy has finally made it to being a master enchantress. Being an enchantress in Fairy Tale is basically you have the ability to just manipulate reality. Because that's basically what Irene does. So Irene basically told her, you now have the power of a master enchantress, and now I can just teach you all the tricks and trade you need to, to basically warp reality as you see fit. So Wendy is on the cusp of being basically the next Irene. She's a little more to go, but she's she's close at this point. Very close. And when that happens, she basically can just soar to the skies and become as powerful as her one day. I guarantee Wendy, when she's an adult, will be as powerful or even greater than Irene. At six, we got Gajil. Now, I know this is going to sound absurd, but the fact that Gajil, while well, got his ass kicked by God Serena, he was able to hold on vastly better than anyone else who's ever fought God Serena, except for Acnologia, but that doesn't count. Not just that, but when he fought Natsu in the arc prior to <laughs> the Labyrinth arc, Natsu basically went all out against him, and Natsu won definitively. It wasn't even close, but it still took Natsu going all out to do it. So Gajil, while is always a step behind Natsu, is still a powerhouse. Let's just hope he gets more wins in the future <laughs> and stops getting all these L's. Well, then again, he did steal the orb from uh, God Serena, so that is a W on his part. At five, we got Gray. Gray has consistently been portrayed as basically equal to Natsu in every way. While he wasn't able to fight one of the four strongest members of Diablos, he was Natsu did, and it's clear that Natsu is equal in power with them, and 
he's evil part of Natsu. It's a pretty common story thing that's happened since the beginning of Fairy Tale. So to say that Great isn't as strong wouldn't make sense plot that has been held out so far. So yeah, I'm keeping Gray at five. Yeah, so number four should be obvious. It's Natsu. <laughs> since I say Gray and Natsu are basically equal with one another. Yeah, so Natsu. Okay, here's the thing. Many people seem to think that Natsu has already surpassed Gildarts. He has not. I'll explain that when we get to it. But Natsu, he's close. He's very close. But he's only as powerful as Suzaku. Because him and Suzaku have been clearly shown to be equals. And before you say, well, he just defeated a dragon, Dormagon. That's after Dormagon got basically nerfed. And then him and Suzaku tag team with a unison raid. No, Natsu is not stronger than Gildars just yet. At three, we have Urza. So Misaka has been stated to basically be on par with Gildarts in power, and also she's been compared to Kirin in power. She both compared him to herself, and other people have done that so as well. She has admitted she's weaker than Kirin, which is why I'm putting Urza below the people that are already on the list. But the fact that she's at Gildarts' power, because the fight with, with Kira was one of the most intense and best fights so far in the 100 Year uh, Quest. Urza fucking gets destroyed and destroys Kira in the process. It is a brutal bloodbath, but it proves that at high difficulty, if it's necessary, Urza is on par with Gildarts at this point. At two, we have Gildarts. The reason why I'm putting Gildarts here is because... Well, Mizuki and Kira were both stated to be equal with Gildarts, and also Mizuki was said to be slightly weaker than Kirin, so I'm going to put Gildarts and Kirin closer together, while Mizuki would be a third. Which is why, for our number one, we have Loxus. Loxus 100% kicked Kirin's ass. Which means, in a fight between Gildarts and, and Loxus, Loxus would kick Gildarts' ass. Like, it is insane just how powerful uh, Loxus has become. He is far and beyond stronger than anyone else in the guild so far. I don't care what anyone says, I don't care what anyone thinks. The fights, <laughs> the last arc, the Dormorgon Labyrinth Arc proves it. Loxus is number one. Okay, so that was my list from Weakest Strongest Members of Fairy Tale. Hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe, give a thumbs up so you can enjoy more Fairy Tale and other anime things. Thank you and have a great day.